in the case of future proofs past. Meme Trunk Media will shine the lens on the 25th President of the United States, William McKinley, whom was assassinated while in office. Before we go in depth into McKinley's character and domestic life, join us on a small journey, as we overlay a mysterious era, prior to the Great Depression and World Wars. In the late 1800s the world was a different place. The remnants of a once enlightened civilization was visible everywhere and apparent in architecture that featured Antiquitech. Antiquitech is the method of generating electricity and healing waves through the structure of architecture using conductive metals and stone, to channel the ether. Palaces of worship were destinations of healing where communities would gather to celebrate amidst a symphony of sound and etheric frequency. As mysterious as it sounds, what may be more concerning is how most have never heard of such technology. To get an idea of the events of a foregone era, historians often look to journalism for a lens into the day. Anyone with any level of discernment knows that journalism cannot be trusted. Having said that, we indeed, had colorful names for the media, at the turn of the 20th century. If you were a writer for hire, you may have been called a hack, and your work, was called a rag. The term yellow journalism, is media that exploits, distorts, or exaggerates in order to conform and create consensus. It does not seek to inform, it serves to imbue, and manipulate. During the peak of circulation battles between Joseph Pulitzer's New York World, and William Hearst's New York Journal, the term, yellow journalism, was coined. In modern times, winning a Pulitzer Prize may suggest, you, are an elite yellow belly hack, glorified, by an industry, of rags. Quote, from, Dongled Trunk. Politicians that use journalism to sow discord, and win the day for international interests, are no more, than a piddly pack of tack hammers, posing as sledges. In 1896, when a McKinley run for president became likely, there was a problem. The opposition could not find anything to attack McKinley on. His life was free from scandal, he was a hard worker and did not use his office to enrich himself. Regardless, they used yellow journalism with all manners of disinformation and slander to try and discredit him. His opponents brought inflammatory accusations citing rape, murder, genocide, and savagery that proved to be wildly inconsistent with the known character of William McKinley. In fact, in 1893, the year of financial panic, McKinley, through no fault of his own, faced bankruptcy. He deeply considered quitting politics and returning to practice law. When his desperate straits became public knowledge, a great outpouring of public sympathy arose. As many as 5,000 donations, poured into the governor's office to aid him in continuing his career. To those who say an honest politician doesn't exist, McKinley was considered to be one of the most devout men to ever occupy the White House. He was a lifelong Christian and member of the Methodist Church. He characteristically proclaimed his spiritual convictions, quote, Our faith teaches, that there is no safer reliance, than upon the God of our fathers, who has so singularly favored the American people in every national trial, and who will not forsake us, so long as we obey his commandments, and walk humbly in his footsteps. From his youth, McKinley shared the strong anti-slavery, and pro-union views of his family. The young McKinley answered his country's call, and volunteered for service. He played his part, along with millions of others, in reuniting the nation, and freeing people from slavery. He served bravely, rising to the rank of major. In fact, he liked to be referred to as Major, even while President. During his political life, he remained steadfastly dedicated to the party of Lincoln, with full civil rights, for former prisoners of slavery. His first political speech took place in 1867. His chosen theme? Give African Americans, the vote. McKinley was quoted saying, Our free thought, and free political action, to be crushed out in From one the section Library of the country, of Congress in Washington, I answer no, no. But that the whole power of the federal government, must be exhausted in securing every citizen, black or white, rich or poor, everywhere within the limits of the Union, every right, civil, and political, guaranteed by the Constitution, and the laws. 
While in Congress, McKinley supported Reconstruction and opposed the white supremacist policies of the Democrats. During his run for the White House, McKinley became the first presidential nominee in American history to address an African-American audience. Included in the hundreds of delegations that made their way to Canton, Ohio, were several African-American delegations that attended the candidate's front porch, because, during the rise of Jim Crow, they knew he did not support discrimination. Bishop B. W. Arnett, of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, stressed to McKinley, quote, We come to assure you that we will never cease our efforts on your behalf, until we have achieved such a victory in November, as was won by our fathers, in their early struggles for liberty. You represent the cardinal principles of the Republican Party, which have so benefited our race. The principles for which you and your comrades, struggled to achieve from 1861 to 1865. Another African-American delegation, had first-hand knowledge of the candidate's character and policies. On July 3, 1896, William Bell, of Massillon, Ohio, delivered a brief message of support as follows. You have always treated us, just as you do, everybody else, with great consideration, and kindness, and on every occasion have been our friend, champion and protector. We come to congratulate you, and assure you of our earnest support, until you are triumphantly elected next November. McKinley was an advocate of sound money, and the gold standard. During his campaign he was slandered mercilessly under the name of God, with a furious yellow journalism campaign that swept the country on behalf of Democratic opponent, William Jennings Bryan. We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Bryan campaigned vigorously throughout the swing states of the Midwest, while McKinley conducted a front porch campaign. At the end of an intensely heated contest, McKinley won a majority of the popular and electoral vote. As president, McKinley signed the Gold Standard Act, effective March 14, 1900, defining the United States dollar by gold weight, and requiring the United States Treasury to redeem, on demand, in gold coin only. This cancelled the Coinage Act of 1873, which eliminated the risk of foreign speculators from creating inflation and debasing the buying power of the American dollar. McKinley also introduced a tariff bill, placing taxes on foreign goods as high as 50 percent. This policy boosted American manufacturing and wages across the country. McKinley was the American hero of the people during the Gilded Age. Regardless of his patriotic success, the illustrious career of William McKinley came to a sudden end at the hands of an assassin on September 6, 1901 at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. McKinley was greeting a long line of visitors at the Temple of Music. The assassin fired at point-blank range twice. McKinley, despite rallying briefly, succumbed on September 14, due to infections caused by the wound. The death of the popular McKinley, was immediately met by a widespread, and genuine outpouring of national grief. During this era, many American workers remained on farms or were employed in small stores, factories, or mills. As the decade advanced, workers moved into big cities to take higher paying jobs in large industrial plants. In November 1910, eight men, Nelson Aldrich, A. P. Ott Andrew, Frank Vanderlip, Benjamin Strong Jr., Arthur Shelton, Henry Davison, Charles D. Norton, and Paul Warburg, met at the Jekyll Island Club, off the coast of Georgia, to write a plan to reform the nation's banking system. The meeting and its purpose were closely guarded secrets, and participants did not admit that the meeting occurred until the 1930s. But the plan written on Jekyll Island laid a foundation for what would eventually be the Federal Reserve System. Three years later, the Federal Reserve Act was passed by the 63rd United States Congress and signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson on December 23, 1913. The law created central banking, managed by fuckheads abroad. A decade later, anyone that was critical of the Federal Reserve had little to no audience. The Roaring Twenties saw an artificially inflated era of financial decadence that fooled media pundits into believing the Federal Reserve was an act of wizardry. 
32 years after President McKinley's death, traitors disguised as stock market speculators pumped the markets into a bubble by loaning money to nearly anyone at 10 cents on the dollar. When the market crashed, treasuries demanded full repayment of loans. Few could pay because their investments completely collapsed. Community banks were consolidated into a megalithic power structure owned by the few. America was raped of its common wealth, while traitors bought up Main Street property, factories and other businesses, for pennies on the dollar. In March of 1933, the gold standard was abandoned, by President Franklin Roosevelt. This unofficially handed over America's money supply to foreign entities. Conspiracy theorists point to following the money. The coordinated attack on America was hardly a conspiracy, and the people that benefited from the 1930s collapse, have trained their successors to always attack the morality and history of America from their ivory towers. They use, yellow journalism, to incite the people, to wrongly blame those that stood for human rights, and unity under God. They pray America never awakens to the owners and lineage of the slave trade. Because this my friends is the beginning of the yellow brick road. As if the terrible ending of President McKinley's life was not bad enough, he has recently been condemned to a second death by character assassination. In 2017, with media attention focused on statues of former slave owners, McKinley's statue, in the small town of Arcata, California, was removed after a vote by city council despite his innocence. President McKinley deserves to have his name cleared. If you believe, in what we believe, please share this video. To show your support, for more content like this, visit meantrunk.com to get involved with Citizen News, because, fighting for truth, and freedom, is intoxicating.